Welcome to the Water Network series of expert interviews. My name is Marina Angelkovic and today I'm talking to Serge Pite, the General Director of Race for Water. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Would you please start by telling us about Race for Water? Of course, uh, Race for Water was uh, created in 2010 by a Swiss entrepreneur who had uh, created uh, quite a sizable company in the telecom business. And he's a, a sailor and a lover of the sea and the ocean. And while still running his company, he decided to do something to prevent the plastic pollution of the oceans. Uh, well, the idea is quite simple. If you look at the situation, uh, if you can give a value to used plastic the same way as uh, metal and glass is, is, has a value, then the idea is that these elements will be collected instead of being discarded and ultimately end up uh, into the ocean. Um, now, maybe just a few numbers so that we know what we're talking about. The problem is huge. It's about 21,000 tons of waste plastic leak into the ocean every day. And there is a consensus about that number, uh, which amounts to about 9 million tons per year. Uh, numbers vary between 8.5 and, and 10, but I mean, it's a very, very substantial amount. Uh, that corresponds to a truck of um, a truckload every every minute. Now, back to the foundation, uh, Marco Simeoni, the president and founder, um, wanted to organize sailing races with boats where a part of the money raised from the participants around the world would be devoted to the pre preservation of the ocean. The crisis of 2008 didn't make this possible and the foundation was called Multi One Attitude before, the same name as the Multi One Design Boats. Um, so it kind of changed the, the, the way things were organized and with the uh, Multi One Design 70 foot trimaran racing sailing boat, he went around the world in 2015 using a protocol of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, the University of Bordeaux and the NOAA. Uh, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. Administration, And this uh, first odyssey confirmed that uh, the problem was huge, that there was plastic everywhere. Um, and maybe one of the major discovery or, or element that came true is that instead of a floating continent of plastic debris, bottles that may, some people may imagine, in fact, it's more of a soup. Plastic degrades in, in, uh, in water due to mechanical effect, due to uh, ultraviolet light, and it goes into small particles. Uh, and, and also to be mentioned that some plastics do sink, in particular PVC, which not, on, not only contains chlorine, which is a problem, I mean, problem among, uh, on top of the other problems, but it sinks, so you can find uh, PVC uh, basically on the bottom of the, of the ocean. And this is um, the, the raison d'être of, of the foundation, is to give value to end-of-life plastics so they are collected when they are still on land before they reach uh, waterways and ultimately the ocean. And if they do reach the oceans, uh, what is the effect on marine life and effect on humans? Okay. Many studies are underway right now, and the preliminary re results are scary. Uh, I think it's also common sense to understand that plastic in the water is, is something which is not right. I mean, it, it's, uh, plastic is not an inert material. It's not like a piece of stone. I mean, a piece of stone or whatever uh, new, uh, inert element. The, the studies that are uh, being undertaken now uh, shows that Okay, maybe, maybe I'll try to be a little more uh, sequential. Uh, let's talk about big debris, like bottles and, and fishing nets, so-called ghost nets, uh, nets that are just discarded in, in the sea, fishing nets, and they are generally of high-quality plastics, like nylon and stuff, so they degrade very, very slowly. Now, these big elements uh, damage any life, could it be birds, turtles, dolphins, I mean, you name them, because they... They take them for um, for food or for yeah basically for food. There are some breathtaking uh, pictures of bottles where you can see literally the teeth of a turtle or teeth of, of uh, you see that the element has been bitten by by these animals, big, big animals. 
and they get this plastic in their stomach and obviously when the stomach is full of plastic then they cannot uh, feed themselves anymore and they die i can strongly suggest to to go and see a, a, a fantastic movie called midway about albatross dying in in the island of midway in the middle of the pacific so this is for big debris now if you get smaller and smaller in the debris as they get they degraded um, then you go to uh, microplastics i mean particles of a few millimeters um, these uh, were found on any any beach that was sampled during this 2015 odyssey um, there is plastic again everywhere and what happens with this is that they keep degrading and they affect the uh, marine life in particular uh, small fishes uh, up to uh, zooplankton and again as this is not uh, inert inert uh, molecule uh, studies are really now showing that it has an effect on the biology the physiology of this of, of the top of the food chain uh, we can see disturbances in the in the way uh, these uh, planktons and these larvae are, are growing the way they reproduce it has all sorts of different uh, um, effects that may endanger again the, the entire food chain now we are at the end of that food chain we are eating these fishes so it's not completely documented yet but it's very, very likely that these, uh, these effects on these, uh, the, top, the top of the food chain will affect us and the end of the food chain. Um, there is another element is that this is well known for a very long time, is that the, the, the fishes, in particular the, 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 the greasy part of the fish, uh, absorbs and retains uh, pollutants. Uh, we know about mercury, we know about uh, I mean, other heavy metals and stuff like that. Now, it really seems that um, the pollutants that are carried by plastics, that could be flame retardants, I mean, many of these plastics, again, not only being plastic, they also carry all sorts of different uh, compounds. Flame retardant is one, there may, there may be others. And these elements, through being conveyed by the plastic, will be uh, fixed in the fish body and at the end end up in our stomach so that line of contamination is, is also now being uh, demonstrated and, and, and studied so not only is that a shame to see plastic in water but it's very clear that it will affect not only marine life but any species on earth and you mentioned the odyssey in 2015 uh, what were the results of the odyssey and what are you planning for the next one Okay. As I mentioned before, again, the protocol of sampling uh, was prepared with the diverse, various universities, and this protocol was conducted uh, really literally uh, around the world. 30 beaches were sampled with a reasonably simple protocol, which means that uh, there is a so-called quadrant. It's a uh, Basically, the, 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 the delimitation of 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So it's not it's not big. Um, 50 by 50 by 10. Again, I think it's it's important that people keep this in mind. Now, this volume of sand was sampled really at the last detail. The least that was found in amounts of plastics is uh, two bottles of 1.8 deciliters the minimum and the maximum is nine on a 50 by 50 by 10 in the region of hawaii nine bottles were, t were, were, were recovered of small amounts of plastics or microplastics as an average again i think this is absolutely scary now why is hawaii the basically the worst places as far as this is concerned it's not because the Hawaiian are, are, are less uh, uh, careful. It's just because they are in the middle of the North Pacific gyre. Uh, the Odyssey also showed that something that was suspected and, and maybe already known is that these plastics uh, uh, tend to, to be uh, concentrated in five gyres, North and South Atlantic, North and South Pacific, and in the Indian Ocean. And again, it's not really floating island, even though there are these last days uh, absolutely scary pictures of floating plastic in the Caribbean. But the gyres we're talking about are even much, much bigger. And again, it's more of a soup 
it's a it's a it's a huge volume of water where this plastic is kind of stagnating there in in a different uh, uh, sea depth okay so this was for uh, 2015 there is a, a complete report that was uh, published uh, with in particular swiss federal institute of technology the epfl here in lausanne and um the, the the second odyssey the one that started this year we the, the is is different in the sense that as the first one was done with a sailing boat um the one of uh, 2017 this year until 2021 is done with a boat that has already been around the world as the first solo boat going around the world at the time he, uh, her name was uh, uh, planet solar the boat was offered to the foundation to the race for water foundation it has been then modified to be able to um, to have on board uh, lots of people if i may say so there is always a, a crew of five but the board can accommodate when it's uh, at, at a port or in, in along the coast up to 25 30 people so the odyssey was designed along three lines what we call learn share act the learn part is the scientific part and we are hosting or basically we are making the boat available to groups of scientists in different places. It happened already in Bermuda, it happened in Cuba, it happened in the Guadeloupe and it will happen again in uh, once we have crossed the, the, the Panama Canal and reached the Pacific because the boat is 100% uh, solar, means you can have even air conditioning, it means you can have a fridge, it means you can have a anything and this is powered with, with solar panels we have uh, over 100 square meters of livable space so people can work can help conferences can talk can and again there are places for, for for the lab the boat is very flat it's a it's a catamaran you'll see pictures on our on our website so it's a perfect place again and all the scientists that that uh, had the chance to to use the boat as a as a as a platform, loved it and uh, unanimously. So that's 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 one thing. And again, we do it in the different places where the boat is stopping over. The second one is what we call chair. Is everything that has to do with uh, raising awareness. Now we raise awareness amongst politicians, amongst uh, any 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 public schools. We have lots of lots of schools on board. I mean, at the end, it's the next generation that will probably make a big difference in the way we, we treat waste plastic so that they don't get into the ocean. So what we call share again is everything raising awareness. Now an, an element which is maybe at least as far as I'm concerned not so expected is that the boat is catching so much attention. It's a fantastic thing to just to see. It means that we get high visibility and in any places we, we've been uh, we are giving the visibility and we are using this visibility to raise again awareness and to try to pass a message let me just give you an example we were at the the america's cup uh, the bermuda and again we had scientists on board we had many people we had the prime minister we had etc but we had the helicopters of cnn that were literally i mean stationary filming the boat and i think this this also conveys a message about the energy transition. I mean, solar panel, kite, we have a hydrogen chain on board, so uh, zero fossil fuel. Um, I think it's a strong message, and this visibility gives us the opportunity to raise awareness about the, the very, very big problem about plastic pollution. So we keep, we're keep we going to keep going and, and, and go around the world. Next year, we have planned uh, Panama in February, then Lima, Peru, where we'll stay two months. Um, uh, we will also work on the implementation of uh, waste to energy projects in the sense that one way and a good way to give uh, value to plastic is to transform them into energy. Obviously, the, 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 the recycling into material is the preferred, uh, preferred step. Now, the quantities of plastic we're talking about just don't make realistic the fact of at least as, as, as long as, as the, the, the system is working as such. So we are in an urgency and transforming these plastics into energy uh, is again a way to, to give them value so that it will be collected. And in many islands, for instance, uh, electricity is produced by diesel engines. And uh, if we can replace the fuel 
it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's basically that. The fuel of these diesel engines, uh, we will prevent the plastics to reach the ocean without increasing the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly is the process of turning plastic waste to energy? There are different uh, systems and processes that have been uh, tested. Um, well, one is quite well known, at least in, 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 in the developed countries in Europe, in the US, is incineration. I mean, ba basically, waste management, we are not waste managers, but obviously we're close to that. Um, waste management is a, either you do nothing, with, and, and it just ends up in, in, in uh, illegal, wild landfills. And then some people put fire to it because it's too big, so they put fire, it smells with all the problems. That's the worst that can happen. Then you have landfills which are controlled, where everything is just dumped into landfills. And this is still the case in many, many, many countries. Uh, the world controlled landfills uh, has to be taken with caution in the sense that it's not completely controlled, as we don't really know what's going to happen, and plastic will degrade over decades. So it's definitely not a good thing. Incineration has been the name of the game in, in Europe and the developing countries for the for the last decades. Incineration, when it's done properly, I would say, why not? I mean, uh, fumes have to be controlled. Incinerations mean that it's a combustion. People, uh, the, the 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 elements, the plastics are burnt. Now we believe that there are better ways of transforming these uh, plastics into energy is by. Uh, pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is basically the contrary of, of combustion. Instead of putting fire to it, and uh, you, you need oxygen to do that, you heat the plastic. So combustion generates heat. Pyrolysis needs heat. So you heat to very high temperature, 300, 400, 600, 800, uh, up to 1000 and, and even more, the plastic without oxygen. So you break the carbon chains. The plastics are composed of carbon and hydrogen mainly. And the idea is to recover that, that, that this uh, chain in the gaseous phase and to have the so-called thin gas, which is the equivalent of the natural gas, but in a synthetic way. So pyrolysis is a very well-known uh, process. Uh, it's very well-known for biomass. It's less well-known for plastics. Uh, we are testing this uh, right now with a pilot project that will be uh, uh, run in in in, Hol in Holland in in Europe, because we need to have a I would say a very controlled place to really understand the specifics of the machine and from where to where in terms of feedstock quality of the feedstock volume, etc. etc. To be then able to implement these uh, elements, which are small units. I mean, an incinerator takes three years to construct. Uh, these units can be installed in three weeks. And uh, as long as uh, humankind has not been able to regulate its production of plastic, this is definitely going to be an interesting solution. So again, pyrolysis, high temperature, syngas. The syngas is then either used as a gas, like any natural gas, to, to do anything you can do with that, or to feed a, a gas engine and to produce electricity either off-grid or on-grid, and it's the complete um, uh, part of the project that has to do with the energy production. The pyrolysis also produces some oil. This oil can be treated like, like I would say, a normal oil and can be um, yeah, yeah, treated uh, in, a, in a petrochemical uh, sense, uh, very well known in the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think it's everyone's problem, and, and, and everyone says that, but I think we, sh we need to repeat this again and again and again. Every one of us, I mean, we have only one planet, and uh, every one of us is really responsible for what we do. We have to reduce the amount of plastic we use, we have to make sure that we we put the necessary pressure on the industry, distribution, manufacturing, packaging, that, that really... I mean, the idea is not to stop using plastics. Plastics are a fantastic element. We need to use them in a better way. And it's us as consumers, as parents, as users that will make a difference. And I'm absolutely confident that the, the industry will, will adapt, as it has always do. I'm coming from, I'm an engineer by background. Uh, we can do much better, and this is our responsibility, each of us. Absolutely. Thank you for the lovely interview. Thank you. Thank you.